Welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, where today we will be interviewing very worshipful brother Zane McCune. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our thoughts and opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions via our website at theworkingtoolspodcast.com. Today on the Working Tools Podcast, we have three of our usual hosts. We have a very worshipful brother, David Colbeth, who is a member of King Solomon Lodge Number no. 60 in Auburn, Washington. I'm Matt Apple, and I'm a member of Mill Creek Number no. 243. We meet in Montlake Terrace, Washington. And we have worshipful brother, Jared, Jared Dunham. <laughs> I apologize, Jared, to you and all Jareds, uh, <laughs> who's a member of Penticton Number no. 147 up in Penticton, British Columbia. And we have our special guest today, uh, very worshipful brother Zane McCune, who's a member of Verity Lodge number 59 in Kent, Washington. So very worshipful brother Zane, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be back here today. It's always a, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you guys. That's right. Yeah, you've been here a bunch of times before, haven't you? It's, bunch of it's... times, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we have Zane on the show today because he is a um, member of Verity Lodge, as I said, and he Verity has been making an effort to be more I think it is fair to debate, say to be more observant in their practice of masonry. I guess, A, would you say that's a fair characterization, Zane? I'd say that's a fair characterization, yeah. And and I guess what does, have it, since we've we've been through the whole book now, uh, what does what does that mean to you as far as as what your lodge is doing? How are they? How are you approaching that? Sure. So so Verity is an old lodge. Um, we were chartered in uh, eighteen eighty nine. We're old lodge. Uh, and I would say that um, probably 10 years ago, there was um, a lot of soul searching within the lodge and lodge officers in what we actually um, want to do with this lodge. Yes, we follow the code. Yes, we follow the standard work. But, you know, what do we do when we're down there and why are we doing what we're doing? So we have made a, a very conscientious effort to... Um, move in the direction of an observant lodge and i don't <clears throat> i'm actually not um i don't say that because of the label in it of itself i say that more importantly as of the practices and the tent behind what an observant observant lodge represents so for us it's not it's not a matter of the the, the label so much as it is a matter of the action um 10 years ago we stumbled upon observing the craft uh, by Andrew Hammer, and it was a um, like a like a big knock on the head, <laughs> you know. And a lot of us recognized, like, yes, okay, this is the call to action that we were looking for, and we went through it uh, quite a bit. And it didn't change overnight our lodge; it changed the direction of our lodge. But it it it's not like all these things just you know, magically fell into place, you know, next month. This has been a, a work in progress. And so this is what I, what I tell lodges now is read observing the craft as a group and talk about it and treat observing the craft like a roadmap where you're not quite sure where you're starting. You're starting from where you're starting from, but it's a roadmap of to get to where you're going, but you need to decide kind of where that is. Or you could think of it more of like maybe a recipe. All right. So these are the eight ingredients that you need in your lodge's recipe. And you need to address every one of those items in the recipe the way that is uh, consistent with what, you know, the direction that your lodge is going. And that might look a little different over here. It might look a little bit different over there. And that's okay because Andrew's not making any claim in the book that this is exactly what an observant lodge looks like, but all observant lodges have these characteristics. And so if your lodge is missing a you know big gaping hole in this set of characteristics, then it's probably not fair to call your lodge an observant lodge, but if you represent these characteristics, that's, that is the direction that you're moving in. So, you know, I don't agree with every, yeah, I'll just say right now, like I don't agree with every single thing that Andrew says in the book, but there's 
a response that we might have to that. And that's like, well, this is our approach. So I'm painting some broad brushstrokes there, but you know, I've had lots of opportunities over the last several years, primarily through my uh, classes at Lodge Leadership Retreat, which is a function that we do in our, our state um, once a year to encourage brothers to read this book as at least a way to uh, get all of the items in that recipe that you need to address because it's a really great format. But I'm not going to sit up here and tell every single lodge in this room, this is exactly how you follow, you know, item number one, chapter one, this is exactly how you should follow it. I'm not going to do that. And I don't think Andrew would ever do that. I, I like how you use the idea of recipe and, and while you might get banana bread at the end, it's going to be slightly different. Everybody has their own little flair on things. Yep. Yeah. I like that. It, it yeah. is interesting too, too, in the book, he often says, uh, like we always, you know, we often comment that, well, it doesn't have to be your opinion, but it should be. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I, what I, the, the approach that I have is um, we should be doing things with intention. There's an intention of doing something. What is that intention that you're trying to, to effectuate? And I think Andrew, the way Andrew says it is observance is, a, is as much a state of mind as a set of actions. That's how he describes observant. Yeah, I know he, he was, uh, where were we? Oh, maybe it was a Gramasonic day somewhere recently. And I had heard him speaking and he was saying that they're trying to develop this other ritual this uh is it some european or scottish ritual or something that they're working on to get approved in dc where they're lodged at alexandria i think yeah and and he was saying one night i guess they were gonna get together i don't know if it was a state of meeting or if it was a practice it must have been a state of meeting and they and there's quite a i guess there's quite a ceremony quite a pomp and circumstance to their opening and and one of the things is that they they process yeah there's a procession the, and and the, i guess a comment was made that well, there's not enough of those guys here. You know, do we really need to do this tonight? And Andrew said, if I am the only one here, I will process. <laughs> and, <laughs> and at first I thought, well, that's a little pompous. But now I understand that you do the do. You, you, you know, whatever is needed, you do it. And yeah. whether somebody's looking or not. Yep. And then the whole, you know, the whole just, you know, maybe to round out kind of verity, the whole, um, you know, label as a observant lodge it's really just more of a recognition by the masonic restoration foundation and uh you know it's not like that is some elite group per se it's it's the acknowledgement and then andrew is you know president of the the mrf and so i spend probably my time talking about restor the idea of restoration than observance when I am in lodge leadership, I'm talking about restoring the lodge, um, not so much observing the craft or or being observant. observant. Uh, and that might just be a little bit semantical, but that's more of what I've gravitated to. But, but um, you know, he's listed Verity in there. And that was through a pretty um, extensive in-person interview with him several years ago. Um, I've had the chance to meet Andrew, um, you know, three or four times and have, you know, solo time with him to just you know, kind of Q and A, um, which was really daunting the first time, but, you know, now, you know, feeling more at ease with that, but that was through a, um, you know, a, a, a interview where he asked quite specific questions about, you know, what we're doing in our lodge about all sorts of things. But it was because I also reached out to him and said, this, this particular lodge has been working on this for a very long time. And I'd like to meet with you about this and get your, you know, your take and your advice and also, you know, um, based on where we've, you know, kind of come, um, what do you think? And so that was where that came about. Did he provide more feedback on suggested direction or Oh yeah, successes or? Yeah, yeah. And also things that we could be doing, um, again, kind of like uh, the characteristics of an observant lodge would, would, you know, would take, you know, we would take on certain characteristics or, um, uh, so yeah, he certainly made, made some suggestions, but I think that was more of like directional and not like, a, like, not like a 180 it was, you know, you know, make sure you're connecting with the rest of the Masonic Rest Restoration Foundation, you know, 
Um, because really what that group is, is just a network of lodges pointed in the same direction. And of all of those hundred some odd lodges of, that are part of MRF, really only a handful are old lodges. Most of them are new lodges that have formed out of a group of guys within a particular district or area or something that want to go into a different direction. Um, we might be a little bit of an oddball in that we've we've taken a lodge that's you know over 130 years old and completely moved it in a, in a different direction. And that meant changing some things that not, you know, there were people there. I'll just say there were brothers that left the lodge. They were like, I, I this isn't the direction of the lodge that, that I want to be a part of. And we said, okay, we respect that, but you're the only person that, you know, wants to continue to do something this way where, you know, and this is why we're moving in this direction. So um, that was okay. We're still brothers. We, we parted ways amicably and said, we'll, we'll see what the district meaning. <laughs> Is, is the MRF, a, is it really a network, a true network where you do some interfacing or is it just a list so you can access and ask them questions or discuss things? Or is there no, the, there's actually an annual symposium that happens in at the end of March every year. And uh, and the agenda is um, it's it's actually really impressive. And they um, uh, they, they kind of go through. Um, you know, they'll, they'll conduct a degree. They'll, they'll have a, there's a table lodge. They have, um, you know, just a whole host of Masonic speakers to come in and talk about all sorts of topics. So, uh, it's called the annual MRF symposium and you don't have to be a lodge on the MRF list to go to it. It's just, you know, that's the event associated with the, you know, with that, with that, uh, foundation. And it doesn't cost anything to be a part of it. It's just a, you know, the lodges that are on that are just acknowledged by this, you know, group that you're moving in this direction and you've done quite a bit of work, you know, in that regard. So, so when, when you guys at Verity decided you wanted to be more, more deliberate, as you said, more uh, intentional about what, what it was you were doing, where did you start? What was your, I mean... I'm assuming you didn't tackle, like you said earlier, you didn't do all, everything at once. Where did you focus your initial efforts? Yeah. Well, you know, th that's a really good question because um, you start with some of the um, the things that you can address with style. Maybe, you, I don't know if we called it this back, that back then, but maybe some of the more low hanging fruit, things that we could do. So for example, um, you know, and one of the things that Andrew doesn't necessarily talk about in the book, because I think, and I think this came up during, I've listened to all of the, you know, the chapters that you guys have talked about, and I love the dialogue that you guys and, you know, bouncing back and forth between everybody. And um, so I've listened to them all, all, you know, prior to, to, to this uh, uh, show. Oh, go on. No, no, it's great. It was great. And I, and I, and I only disagreed with, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, no, seriously, go on. No. <laughs> One of the things I think that Andrew is assuming is that the lot not, and a lot of it's because it's these new lodges, they, they're not forming a lodge and owning a building. Most of them are non-building owning lodges. And we had the unique situation of, you know, now we we own a lodge. So, you know, let's start to clean ourselves up and make and present ourselves nicely. And we had um, a little bit of money. And so we, we, we actually started honestly with painting the outside of our building. We just started with painting the outside of the building. It looked really nice curbside appeal. And a lot of us had pride when we showed up to the lodge and we were like, this was really cool. What else can we do? Hey, we should, we should uh, involve the new guys as they join, you know, in some of the work that we do like actual labor down at the lodge. So we started doing that. We worked on the dining room. Then we started put, putting our attention into the, um, you know, the preparation room, which we converted into a library. And that got the conversation started about um, a chamber of reflection. Like, how, how would we do this? Why would we do this? And we, we need to make sure that we do it well. So some of it was just um, a little bit of, wasn't so much esoteric per se, but it was just, you know, presenting ourselves and feeling good about it. It's like putting on a new suit. There's something, there's something different that happens to your attitude when you are a sharp dressed man. It's kind of what we did with the building to some extent. And that started to, you know, 
everybody was like, well, what, what are we doing? And they got all excited. And, and then, then we started going through the book because we had all read that too. And what we tried to do was just go through every chapter, like how would we approach this chapter? What can we do now? And ran through each of those chapters and came up with a verity version of, of you know, what, what, what Andrew was talking about in each one of those chapters. When did your, and with the makeover of the building, when did your lodge room, the ceremony room transformation was, I, it was before the dining hall and that, and, but it was after the outside painting, but I think you had also started your COR, your chamber reflection had already begun as well. So. Well, yeah. So, so that's a really good question. And the reason that, you know, things started kind of, we didn't just, we, we went through chapter one through eight, almost like a feedback loop. And I don't know if I've heard Jared talk about this. I can't remember who made him. We know we went through this like a feedback loop year after year after year. Like, what are we, what can we do better about this? What can we do better about this? So it wasn't like we just said, all right, chapter one's done. Let's move on to chapter two. We got this nailed. It was like little bits of each one of the chapters as we were kind of cycling through all of them. So the dining room was first because that was our money maker. And we took the last you know, bit of money that we had in our savings account and poured it into the dining room so that we had a, a nice looking dining room and not a dingy looking dining room because that was that was what we were going to rent. And we started renting that to the public. And we put off the lodge room as long as we could because the lodge room was for us, but that was a one shot thing. Once we spent the money there, you know, that would have been it. So we put the money into the dining room and started creating our rental program. And then as the money started coming back in and we were able to put more money back into the building, that's when we turned our attention to um, the lodge room in a really significant way. And we've, we probably put, um, you know, maybe $25,000 into the lodge room when we, when we got to that point, the overall, the last 10 years, we probably put, you know, $150,000 into the building, but our rental revenue this last year was $150,000 to public rentals. It's rented a lot. So I got to ask, was your, did you guys do ritual well before this? Ooh, that's like, a, I'm hearing, cause you're, you're talking about, you, you spent all this money making the building nice, but when it was your, did you guys, did you not have a problem with your ritual beforehand? Did you, when, when did you decide that? I mean, the bones are nice to get all. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, but, but what, what about the, the meat of yes, a lodge meeting? Great question. So so at one point in time, the lodge as a whole did, did the ritual well, but we didn't talk about what that ritual meant. And then a bunch of people left the lodge because they didn't like the direction that we were going. And a lot of us kind of felt a, a little bit orphaned. And we all sat down and said, and we are all, you know, good ritualists. I mean, but we had, you know, holes and we, but we had new guys joining. So what we all said was, you know, and it really started with, we want to be able to say that we've, we, we've earned the charter that we've been granted, which requires 15 master masons to know all of the work and all of the degrees. And that's our goal. So let's build that. How do we build that? And that meant gener you know, building a new generation of ritualists. So those of us that were good ritualists, we continue to take on larger parts. And as new guys joined, okay, this is the part that we need you to learn. And it wasn't what a lot of lodges, I see a lot of lodges do is they say, okay, who wants to do what part? And they leave it to kind of happenstance to see who does what. And we didn't have, we didn't take that approach. We said, here's what, here's the part that we need you to learn, brother. And we'll give you a lot of time to learn it. Our next degree isn't until, you know, two months from now. So you have two months to learn this. But what that did was able to uh, organize who was learning what. So as, so as, you know, the new guys became a little more seasoned, they were learning bigger parts and the new, new guys that were coming on, they were learning the introduction parts. And it took us probably four years or so to rebuild a new generation of ritualists where to the point now, you know, we've got, you know, well, we hit this probably three years ago where we had all of the, all of the parts for all three of the degrees covered within our lodge. And now we've just gone beyond that. We're trying to build out the, the depth of the bench so that, you know, we start substituting, you know, people in and out, you know, um, 
I haven't actually conferred. I think I might have conferred one degree in, in 2023, and it was because of the person who was who was being raised, but I didn't have to. I, I mean, I could be a sideliner in my own lodge because there's so many people that know the ritual, but that's not an accident, and that's not because we just let people say, you know, here's the, you know, oh, here's the part that I want to do. Um, because that's not enough organization behind casting a, a a degree team. So that took a little while. We were not there initially. <laughs> nope. Um, and, and, and then you also, you also have some other intention too with the the the, the agapes and other things. So, like you were talking about, it's not just the ritual. It's not just the nice building. It's also the meeting behind and discussions. Yeah. So one of those. So so thanks for asking that question. So one of the one of the actual complaints, the real complaint that we all had, and when I say complaint, I meant more like what we were trying to do was build a lodge that we wish we had joined. That's what we really wanted wanted to do. This is the lodge that we would have really liked to have joined. And the lodge that we joined didn't talk about these degrees with any like interpretation or discussion or anything. And so now what we do is uh, on degree night, um, the candidate arrives and he's met by the Tyler and then he's uh, conducted to the chamber of reflection. And we do that on all three degrees. Now we used to only do that on the EA degree. We had a long talk about why we do that and how we would change that up for each of the, each of the degrees. So we do that for, for each of the degrees. Now we're happy to talk about the chamber of reflection now if you want. And then we have then, and then he finishes in that and we open and he comes in and we conduct him through the degree. And then after the degree, we have what we call agape, which is a big, it would look a little bit like a, like a, like a festive board, but, and there's dinner that is served, but really the intent behind that is to talk about the degree, ask questions, offer testimonial to the people that are there on why Freemasonry is important to maybe them. Um, but all that does is just kind of breathe life into the, to the purpose of that particular degree. And it's guided, you know, if it's, it's like, uh, you know, there's a moderator who's going to maybe offer some thoughts, but then is there to kind of get people talking. And it usually takes about, you know, five minutes before all of a sudden everybody's just bing, 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 you know, talking about the degree. But that's what we do after the degree. Um, and everybody has loved that. They they like that approach. Um, so maybe to back up a step, we have, because you guys talked a lot about dining in um, one of the one of the sessions. We have like five different opportunities for a meal with Verity Brothers. We have an annual table lodge, which is all the toasting and everything that you'd kind of expect. And we have a great time at that. We have the agape that we just talked about. We have our, what we call festive board, which is where we, we have it down at the lodge building, but we don't tile it. And it's, we invite guys who are on our list of people who are interested about our, our lodge. And right now I think we have um, 16. And all of them have either been to some, maybe they haven't come at all, or maybe, you know, we just took one of those 16 last night and he finally petitioned and he had been coming to events and events and events. So one of those, just one of those pe just petitioned last Friday night, but we'll invite those guys down to the festive board at the lodge. So we have a dinner casual, but then we spend some time walking around the building, talking about Freemasonry, talking about our lodge in particular, because this is part of actually guarding the West gate. We want them to be very, very, clear on what kind of a lodge we are and if they want to be a freemason and we're not the right lodge we'll help them find a lodge that's no problem at all but we're very upfront about things that are a little bit unique about us and if that's the kind of lodge culture they're looking for you know then we're probably the right fit but if you're looking for something different set of characteristics that's okay too and we've got brothers in other lodges that you know that they might be more comfortable in so we've that's part of guarding the West Gate is this table, this festive board. Then we have dinner before our stated meeting. And then we have, um, and dinner before our stated meeting is just Masons. Sometimes we'll have the Rainbow Girls down there doing a, um, a dessert table. And it's our way of supporting them. But it's not really meant to be a, 
invite your wife down and things like that. This is just, this is a guy's night. So guys dinner beforehand and a guy's stated meeting. Um, and then we also have one more and that's just a casual night out at a local restaurant. We call it mystic Thai night. And that will also, we invite guests too. So those are the five ways that we kind of do our dining. We, we were talking in one of our lodge shrink the lodge sessions about activities and things we're doing. And, uh, we we've added on several of those as well, social nights, other things and supper and course. And, and we, we wanted to do some other things as well, but maybe one of the guys said, why do we have to do something that's always around food? And I just wanted to turn around and slap him, but I didn't want, couldn't do it in front yeah. of everybody. And <laughs> because I immediately thought that's one of the five senses. I mean, we talk about it in our degrees and you yeah. know, it's part of who we are as humans and meals provide the opportunity to have conversation and develop friendships and understand who it doesn't have to yes we can go and do something else sure we've gone to to the range we've gone to we've all gone out to like like old-time barbershop and all you know sat back in the chairs and done shaves and everything like that i mean we've done a couple of other things but the festive board is what actually kind of grew out of the casual nights out because what we were finding was there was there were we wanted an opportunity to control the environment just a little bit more and talk about our lodge because to answer questions or just in it, not that you couldn't do that in a restaurant, but sometimes restaurants are loud um, and you're competing for attention from a hostess or a waitress or something like that. And so we, we decided to do one festive board every quarter and you could kind of think of it as a bit of an open house, but we certainly put a lot into it and um, you know, we comp the dinner that night for the guys that are interested in coming down. And we spend probably a third of the time talk, you know, with dining and then another two thirds just talking about Freemasonry or peel off and do a little bit of tour of the lodge and talk about things. Or if there's a guy who's maybe um, been to several of our events, maybe that's the night that we pull him aside and kind of a serious conversation about his petition. Sir, I've got SWAT going by me. Oh no! <laughs> they didn't pull my driver. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, I'm kind of looking at my cheat sheet of uh, the different chapters in um, in observing the craft. Um, we have enough time. Let's see. You know, I was going to ask. I I wanted to ask about. Um, I know one of the things we talked about in the Blue Room and also on the show and stuff was uh, some of the things you do in Lodge and maybe that would just be a great break to to kind of pull away and come back. No, mass okay, okay, just about point that out myself. Yeah, it's about time that we we log off and log on again and uh, and record another episode. Assuming you're willing to hang sure. around with us and yeah, listen to us yap some more. That sounds yeah. good. All right, thanks. So I'll just mention for all the uh, brothers that are interested in meeting Andrew. Uh, he will be visiting Verity Lodge number 59 in Kent, Washington on March 15th at our stated meeting, which is at 7.30 p.m. Uh, come at 6.30, enjoy our dinner, $25 a person, a fantastic meal, and meet Andrew and and listen to his uh, presentation at our stated meeting. Love to have you there. And do you have a website, Zane? Do you need to get tickets or anything ahead of time for supper? Uh no, you can actually pay at the door. You can uh, PayPal us at verity59 at, at hotmail.com. Okay. And it's $25 for, for dinner, but you can, you can pay at the door too if you want to. Will it be there information on your website as well at verity59.com? It's uh, probably the place to go is actually on Facebook and find us at verity59. We'll have that out there. All right. Well, in that case, um, on behalf of Jared and David and the, the Abs and Stephen and myself, uh, thank you, Zane, for, for being on the show today. And uh, we look forward to talking to you all again next time on the Working Tools Podcast. Good night. 